There we go. So we'll get started. So I'll hit. So Ken, uh, oh, and Ken, if you want to just like turn off your camera or turn off the show, what is it? Show video, I guess, for non video performers. Okay. Should we mute as well? Uh, no, it's okay. You don't have to mute unless there's background noise. You don't have to. Okay. Mute. Yeah. If I can't, if you do mute though and I can't hear you, I'll go like this and I'll do okay. the same way to kind of turn your uh, microphone back on. <laughs> All right. So we'll get started. All right. So Ken, I'm going to hit start webinar. Hi, I'm Mike Aoki. I want to welcome you to today's GTACL Intelligence webinar. It's all about how to get your contact center team recharged for 2021. And I just want to start by um, introducing our panelists for today's session. And you can see their videos there on your screen as well. But I want to introduce uh, Jenny Dempsey, Lisa Deal, and Jamie Siebel. And they'll be the panelists for today's session. And I'll be your host again as we go through this. And if you want to read their backgrounds, because they have really amazing backgrounds, you can look at the registration page or the LinkedIn post for this to find out more about each one of them, or check out as well their websites that are there listed on the screen. I should mention as well that today's session is also being recorded and the recording itself will be uploaded to YouTube and a link sent to all the people who've registered for today's session so you can review it later on or even share it with team members and colleagues as well. The topic of wellness, of course, is universal. We're all going through it this year. So it's a really great topic to go and share with people that you love, to go and give those tips about wellness and how to be able to recharge and get ready for next year. And also as well, it's gonna be a very interactive session. So feel free to ask questions. On your Zoom window, at the very bottom of your Zoom window screen, there are buttons on there for chat, and also for Q&A, and you can use either one of those, so either the chat window or Q&A window, and type your questions in there, and type them all the way throughout the program, whatever you feel like you wanna ask the panel for more information. And I'll actually read off those questions and ask the panel those questions at a couple of times, roughly halfway through, and again, near the end of the session, so you can get more information and more answers as well. Also, we have a question for you or a poll for you, so I just wanna pull this one up. On the screen in front of you right now, there's a poll. And the question is, how often do you experience stressful events during a typical week? So during your average week, how often do you experience that? Perhaps you rarely experience that. You're quite fortunate. It could be once a week or more. Okay. Sometimes I feel like my weeks are seven or more times a week. But whatever it is, vote for that one. Okay. I'll give you a few moments to go and do that. Great. And we have quite a few responses already. Um, and again, vote for whichever answer is the most appropriate for you. And I'll share these results with all of us in just a moment. So you can see how all the other people on the webinar voted for that. And most of you have voted now, three quarters have voted. I'll just give another few seconds and, uh, and then we can take a look at the results. Okay, so I'll share the results now on screen. And if you take a look at the results, the most popular answer was two to three times a week in terms of, of experiencing a stressful event. And again, this could be either at work or at home. The key here though is again, two to three times a week, four to five times a week was also a very popular answer as well. Together that accounts for almost 64%, uh, 63%, uh, two thirds of the answers were you know two to three times or four to six times a week. So again, a lot of stress that's out there and a lot of stress that takes place in terms of the workplace and what we've gone through this year in terms of the pandemic and also for a lot of contact centers adjusting to work from home and trying to make that work or going back to the office and trying to get readjusted to that as well. So we'll talk to you about wellness. You know, you can tell by these answers with two thirds or more of us going through this kind of, you know, stressful events at least two to three times a week or more. There's a lot of stress out there. So how do we cope with that? And we'll talk about that. And for the very first part of this, I just want to turn to uh, Jenny, actually, Jenny Dempsey, and just ask a question in terms of, and I know you want to share a personal experience with us in terms of why are you so passionate about well-being and wellness in the contact center? Thanks, Mike. Well, I, I, you know, wellness is very personal. It's very different for everyone. And so what I'm going to share is a personal story. And the reason why I'm so passionate about it is because one day, uh, several years ago, I had an anxiety attack in front of my customer support team. I was leading a team of several people and there were a lot of things that were going on in the background that I was stuffing down under that rug, uh, things that had been going on for years, um, recovering from an eating disorder, other anxiety related issues. And then one day it all bubbled to the surface when one customer service agent asked me a question and phew, I just, 
tumbled. It, it, and it, for anyone who's experienced an anxiety attack, they are frightful and you don't really know what's going on. It wasn't my first anxiety attack, but it was the first one I couldn't hide from because I'm sitting in front of my customer service team and we're supposed to be happy and helping customers, right? So from that point on, I knew I had some hard work to do. I knew I had to get real with myself. I had to be more authentic and deal with what's actually going on. And so from that point forward, it became something, became about a healing for myself. Um, not that I was broken in any way, but in a way to kind of like help myself navigate these feelings that I was stuffing. And then in turn, that helped me, helped my team, that helped the team help customers. And it just made sense. So that's really where it stems from for me and why I'm so passionate about it because I'm not that great at it. I burn out all the time and I learn from it and I want to talk about it and uh, help others talk about it too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Jenny, thank you for sharing that story with us. I, I know it's a very personal story. It also really ties in again to that survey that we just did about how two thirds of people are going through a lot of stress, you know, and the stress does add up, especially in, in a customer, you know, in a contact center, customer service focus, where there is a lot of stress, obviously, both in terms of external customers, but also in the team as well. Right? There's escalations and personnel issues, things like that. So a lot of different stressful events that, you know, that take place as well. So Jenny, thank you for sharing that with us. And you know, it, it's just really important for us. And that's why I think this is such a great topic to go and end the year with, because of course it's just you know, a way to help us cope with and deal with this and also look forward to you know, what to do to be able to help cope with next year as well and, and hopefully improve things for 2021. And I just wanna ask a question too, and this one's actually Jamie for yourself. And, and I know in terms of your background in psychology and also you do a lot of industrial consulting with different organizations. And so Jamie, how does a contact center leader so how does somebody in that position, a director, manager, director, VP, how can they identify the signs and symptoms of stress and burnout, uh, especially when it comes to work from home employees as well as the ones in the office? Right, so some things, um, you know, you're going to be able to, when you're working um, with your team, you're gonna be able to sort of be able to observe certain things um, and others are going to be through sort of conversation, right? So some things you can observe, you know, lack of concentration, you can see sort of in this, in this, um, in the slide here, lack of concentration, irritability, kind of uh, worrisome thoughts, sort of overthinking, or, you know, having a disproportionate response to a given situation where we're kind of, you know, getting upset about like little trivial things, or, you know, getting impatient, those are kind of some cues, um, you know, unexplained exhaustion, if you can kind of see your team members, you know, being exhausted, um, physical uh, ailments, oftentimes stress and burnout will uh, show up in the body, in the stomach, it could be headaches, um, it could be, you know, feelings of, um, oftentimes I'll see um, clients feeling sort of faint or dizzy, and that can be a, a great sign that um, there's just, you're approaching stress or burnout, uh, sleeping problems, um, insomnia, or any major change in sleeping patterns. Um, it could be, you know, neglect of self-care if, you know, people are not, you know, you're not doing the regular physical activity, you're not eating well, uh, drinking uh, more than you normally would. Um, those are kind of some things as well that can be indicators that you're on your way to sort of stress or burnout, um, or also like feelings of, um, like feeling numb or apathetic, right? Just losing interest in the things that you normally would find uh, interest, whether it's hobbies or social engagement, or work as well, right? If you have a, an employee or a teammate who's normally like just very engaged with work and they're just sort of like flat, you know, no, no happiness or joy and no real sort of sadness or despair or, you know, anger on the other side, if you're just sort of seeing sort of flat, um, that can be another sort of sign or indication um, that your teammate or employee is sort of on the road towards burnout. And Jamie, those are really important clues to, to look for and listen for. And I like the fact that you mentioned some of the ones that, you know, that, again, that flat sort of, you know, unaffected voice or vocal tone, facial expressions, et cetera. They're things that we, you know, as contact center leaders, you can see in terms of your one-on-ones coaching sessions with employees. You might even be able to hear it on the voice when they're with customers as well. So it's just listening for those clues, you know, to try to find out. So thank you for sharing that. And again, just some key things to watch out for, because part of the leadership role is to try to 
find out where your team is at, find out where each one of those team members is at and, and watch and listen for those clues. So, you know, when you might want to go and step in to, to help them with that. So thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thanks. And I know Lisa for yourself as well, being a contact center leader and having your center at, uh, at Blue Diamond as well. What are some of the getting to know you ideas that you've used, you know, in meetings, including team meetings sometimes as well that are not work related. And again, just a chance to go and interact and possibly observe some of these signs of burnout and hopefully be able to prevent it as well. Yeah, one of the things that uh, I learned early on during, you know, our stay at home is, you know, really being able to reach out to our employees. You know, normally if you're in the office, you have, you know, your water cooler conversations or you're just talking amongst yourself. And in a virtual world, you know, I, you're isolated. You're very much isolated. And, you know, if you don't have a lot of family, you're by yourself. And so one of the things that, that we've adopted and, and I've adopted with my teams is more getting to know you type team meetings and whether it's just a quick 30 minutes, you know, it's not work related. And so, you know, I'll come up with some sort of icebreaker type activity, you know, um, and I've done it not only with my in-house team, but with my contact center um, team as well. And we'll talk about, you know, hey, what's your favorite Olympic sport or what was the worst Christmas gift you ever received? Um, you know, things like if you had a chance to work with any celebrity, who would that be? Um, the most of the fun one that we thought was if you could have an unlimited supply of one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? You know, everyone thinks, okay, going for money or food. And then you start to think about it and you hear people talk about it. And it's something that's way something you would never even have thought of. And it's like, oh my gosh, that's pretty awesome. Um, you know, I just with my, my contact center team earlier this week, we had a virtual pizza party. And so it was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, Blue Diamond sponsored this. And so I had pizzas sent to all of their homes. And to arrive around the same time is our meeting. And so when pizza arrived, everyone was eating pizza, it was hot, we were talking. And, um, you know, it just, it really helps to have that sense of getting to know who you are as a person and helping them to really say, hey, we're here, we care. This is not always work, 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 but let's talk as human beings. And it seems to make a difference. And um, one of the things that I'm, that I'm planning, we couldn't get into the holidays because the holidays are so busy, but after the first of the year, when things start to calm down, is taking my in-house team and, and some other people within Blue Diamond um, into a virtual escape room. Um, and so where as a group for an hour or two, uh, we could actually have some fun and compete against each other. And so anything that you can do to not you know, to, to gather your team, you know, whether it's a virtual happy hour or, um, you know, just having a pizza party or things like that, it really, really helps take the stress out of. Um, it's not always work-related, doesn't always have to be work-related. Okay, and that's a really good point. I like that, Lisa, but just again, not having to be all work-related because again, there's that fun aspect, there's that social aspect, and especially, uh, you know, I remember when I was, you know, for starting out in call centers, contacts, while well, they were called call centers back then, you know, it was a lot of socialization. People go out after their shift and go have drinks or go hang out together. You made friendships there, friends I'm still in touch with 20 years later. So again, there's that social aspect as well to the workplace. And one that's more challenging, of course, if you're in a work from home environment, but again, still that social aspect. So, you know, it's really important and I just like the idea that you said about, you know, virtual escape room for work from home employees. So again, just having those kinds of experiences, both, you know, virtual right now, and hopefully by this time next year, you know, back to being face to face again. But again, just being able to have that interaction is so important as well, you know, going forward. And I just want to share as well, just ask the question in terms of, you know, looking at from a, from a contact center leader standpoint, um, you know, I know Lisa, you've got some picture, pictures that you that you sent here for the slides. And I love the one about the dad with the telephone trying to hold, you know, two, two screaming kids there, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I, I guess just a little quick follow-up question for you, Lisa, in terms of, of this is, you know, um, just, you know, what have you done, you know, to be able to help sort of, I guess, cope or give space or room for, you know, people to have sort of distractions in the, in the background, because, you know, a year ago, if you ever heard a dog barking in the background on someone's call, it was a cause to go and, you know, talk to them about that. Now, of course, a year later, when you call a place, even a bank, you'll hear a dog barking in the background, you'll hear a car honking going by or whatever. Uh, you know, how, have you have you made allowances for that in your staff? You know, and 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 I, I think that, you know, these pictures speak, you know, volumes because I've got people on my team who have five kids at home. And, um, you know, so they're balancing not only, you know, 
their work because they need to be able to put food on the table, but they're balancing, you know, kids in their online education. And so we've been really as lenient as we can possibly be, you know, if they need to take, you know, adjust their hours, you know, so that they have time for kids and getting to school, um, you know, to making sure that they're logged into their computers, okay, let's start 30 minutes later. And so we've been really lenient about, you know, helping, helping, to be, you know, yeah, we know that there's work that has to be done. We have consumers that are calling us, but if I stagger my my staffing to say, okay, this person has, you know, they've got e-learning for their children, so they're going to start work at 10 o'clock versus 8 o'clock. You're just making sure that we're being as flexible as we can be. So we're understanding that, yeah, yeah a year ago, you're right, if there would have been a, a dog barking or a child, you know, screaming in the background, that wouldn't have been acceptable, but today it is. And one of the the other fun things that we created was a, an online bingo game. So here at Blue Diamond, every time we hear a child crying or a, a, a dog barking, that's a check on our bingo card. And so at the end of the month, we're going to turn in our bingo card and say, yeah, here's the date in the meeting that I was in that I heard this, this, and this. And so it's just becoming more um, real and, 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 and um, really just everyone's very accepting of that. And so you can make a game out of it and um, it gets a little bit more fun, but you know, just it's really, really crucial and important you know, that we continue to stay flexible for our employees and understanding that you know, what their life looks like you know, and your own life and making sure you're finding that work-life balance. Okay, good. And I love the phrase work-life balance as well. Hit the nail on the head with that one in terms of being able to adjust to that. And that's so important. And now's a time for us to go in as well, just do sort of free-flowing Q&A. So again, if you have questions, feel free to type them in, uh, either in the Q&A window or the chat window. Now's your chance to go and ask the panel any extra questions. We do have a couple of questions already that I'll, I'll, I'll focus to you, but as well, I just want to go and ask a quick question, Jenny, for yourself, which is in terms of looking at we're at right now in terms of appeal services. I know there's some wonderful, uh, you know, things that you're doing to be able to go and help in terms of just again giving back to, you know, being very naturally focused, being able to go and help with that. And you know, one of the things when it comes to sort of burnout is when people feel like what they do doesn't matter or what they do doesn't mean anything in this world. Versus, and I see the smile already. What you're doing, of course, at Appeal does matter a lot to the world. So, Jen, if you just want to mention a little bit in terms of, you know, how does that help your team? You know, just knowing that they're contributing so much. Gosh, that is a loaded question, Mike. <laughs> so, I mean, at the end of the day, customer service is just people helping people, no matter whether we are doing something that is impacting the world on a global scale or we are helping someone fix their phone. It doesn't matter. We are helping someone. And that creates a ripple effect. And I think when team leaders are able to share stories of that impact and share it with the team, share it with the company and everyone hears this, you can understand your individual place in that impact. And it really becomes part of the culture of the entire company, not just the customer support team. This isn't an isolated thing. It is the entire company. The impact is from the head honcho to the front lines. And if the company culture can really adopt that, that will help every individual person feel like they are a part um, in that situation and uh, in that, you know, culture and not just a hamster on the wheel, which is very easy to feel like that, even when, you know, sometimes for people who work for other companies that are doing major, major things to help others, you, if the company culture is very, you know, not supportive of customer stories or, you know, just sees you as a number, then you're still going to feel like, you're not a part of anything. And so I really just lean it into the contact center culture, the company culture at large, and remembering that it's just people helping people and the ripple effect will carry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love that phrase. I've used it before as well, but people helping people. And as long as you see that linkage, right, that you're actually mm -hmm. helping people, you'll feel that sense of contribution and that sense of right. making a difference, which of course helps with wellness, you know, right. going forward. I love the point you made as well, that it's from the top down, from the CEO on down, are they established that culture? It's customer service is not a department. It's the entire company's attitude. Right. And as long as that's there, everybody will feel like they contribute. It's when the contact center doesn't feel that way. When they're right. just a the complaint department, back when they used to call them those, right, that people right. feel frustrated and burnt out in that role. So I, I love that part. And and Jim, I'd like to ask you a question as well, just from a, a psychology background, in terms of how important is it for someone to feel like they are contributing 
that what they do makes a difference? How does that help combat that burnout sense? Huge, uh, especially, you know, in, in this, you know, in the younger generation, uh, finding meaning, um, you know, in work is huge to satisfaction and engagement. I think, you know, in, in previous times, you know, previous, you know, generations, it was just the job that you did to sort of pay your bills. And now, you know, we're, we're lucky that we have this opportunity to find something that we love to do. And, um, and people are really looking for something that is meaningful and purposeful in their lives. So yeah, absolutely. If, if you don't find that, if you don't have that sense of purpose and meaning, you're going to become disengaged. Um, and it, yeah, it can lead to stress and anxiety and depression, absolutely. Okay, good. It sounds like it's really up to the leaders, both at the contact center level and also more senior in the company to really help, you know, share those stories, to get that sense of mission, that sense of connection, you know, all the way through as well. Uh, we also had a question as well from our audience. So Neil Toth, actually, Neil, hi, I'm glad, I'm glad you're out here for the, for the webinar as well. Uh, and, and first of all, Neil's coming was an amazing panel as well. And I agree, they're just, set, they're, all three of you are just absolutely amazing, you know, in terms of being able to go and contribute to this. And Neil's question is, I'm curious what studies or data exist, you know, connecting wellness in the contact center to things like customer satisfaction and other business results. So what's the linkage between having really well, happy employees, engaged employees, and having great customer satisfaction? And I'll leave this up to whoever wants to respond to it. If you know of any studies, any linkages, anything that you see in your organization or different associations like SOCAP. I'm, I don't know if I know of any studies offhand, um, I, but, I, but I can tell you from experience, you know, when, um, when your employees feel engaged and they feel well and they feel happy, you know, that's going to come across to your consumers. Um, you know, you, it's, it's always that, you know, one thing I learned early on in my career is you kept a little mirror, you know, right next to your computer. And when you're smiling in that mirror, that smile will come through on the phone. And um, so it's always been something that I've, I've learned and have taught, you know, throughout my years in, in customer service is, you know, put a little mirror by your computer. And um, I don't know if that, that go, answers Neil's question about, you know, any kind of data behind it, but, you know, we have seen um, how that reflects in, you know, customer satisfaction or just even be able to just put that smile through the phone makes a huge difference. And, and I can also say, you know, I also don't have the stats there, but, you know, I do a lot of work with uh, couples within organizations and, you know, and, and personal relationships. And you can see when one person is unhappy, um, it's an energy, right? And it's, and it's a little bit of a, um, like almost like an infinity loop that affects the other person and it sort of goes back and forth uh, between people. So if, if someone is unhappy, if that sort of frontline person is unhappy and engaging with the customer, it's certainly an energy that is put out there that is, that is felt, absolutely, yeah. Okay, good, excellent, I love that. And, and here's another question for you as well. This is actually from Neil Delin. And the question really sort of quickly recaps in terms of, you know, Lisa, what you're saying about being able to just establish a personal connection with your team, you know, and have, having somebody like a team member with five kids and the kids crying in the background, making that connection. And Neil's question is, what are some other ways that you can keep this level of seeing, you know, with your employees at level of, of being able to get to know your employees on a personal basis and also be more understanding with them after the pandemic is over? Because right now, of course, it's been kind of that almost crisis mode for nine months, but even when things get back to quote unquote normal, how do we keep that engagement? How do we keep that level of personal relationship with their team members? Uh, I guess, Lisa, I'll ask you this one first and then Jenny as well, if you want to comment. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's going to be really critical um, that you're keeping that same level of, you know, getting to know you um, in, in your team meetings. Now, you know, whether you're sitting now in a conference room or you're still virtual, I, I think it's really important that, you know, companies realize that we're going to have a new normal. We can't go back to where we were last January. You know, things, the world has shifted um, so greatly and, uh, you know, we've had to make so many changes and um, so many, I don't want to use the word sacrifices, but a lot of people have made sacrifices. And so you have to be able to take that same um, 
mentality that you have now into what we're going to consider the new normal in 2021. And you have to be able to keep that flexibility. And you have to be able to say, okay, things aren't going to go back to the way that they were. What is the new normal? I think, you know, a lot of companies are expecting that we've always worked in the office. And so now we're going to all come back. But I think there's going to be a shift where, you know, a certain percentage of your employees are never going to come back into an office environment and they're going to stay virtual. And, um, you know, how do you adapt to that kind of that hybrid model, which is going to be part of the new normal? Okay, good. All right. Excellent. I like that. And, and, uh, and Jenny, how about yourself as well? How are you keeping those one on one relationships alive with your, with your team, even after the pandemic? Well, they were going on before the pandemic. I think for some, it, for some, it might go back to, and I sound like a broker record saying this, but part of the company culture, like, you know, maybe this is a great change for some companies to finally become more human at their offices and not just numbers where they're just, you know, employees clocking in, clocking out. And so if the company culture is able to adapt to these changes and we're able to be consistent. So, cause it's like, you know, we, even now we still have to be consistent with the check-ins and we have to be sensitive to the check-ins because not everyone wants to talk about their personal life when they're under a crisis to their manager. Right. I mean, we have to be very like, it's a fine line and we have to be very cautious when we are asking questions to get to know people on this whole employee level, but also realizing that there's so much more going on outside of work and that what shows up on the zoom meetings for individuals might not be what is actually happening, right? Like the smile might not mean that they're happy on the inside. Um, and so consistency is going to be key, but making it a part of the company culture, if it wasn't already is going to really make or break it because all most companies are adapting to that. And if yours doesn't, people might not want to work there and there might be a shift. So. Okay, good. No, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that Jenny as well about that consistency, the culture. Again, it gets back into what are those habits, right? That people are doing. And also the idea too, about if you don't offer that in your culture, you know, sooner or later, right? It may catch up to you in terms of losing great people. And I just want to mention, Jenny, you do such a great job as well, I know, of maintaining relationships. I know you and I met via Twitter, actually, in terms of customer experience tweets and stuff, you know, I think four or five years ago, right? And, yeah. and again, you're really good at being able to reach out and be able to go and help, you know, make those connections with people in terms of common interests, like customer experience, customer service. And I also like your point too, as well, about adjusting your style to meet different employees' personalities. Some are extroverts that will tell you everything. I know mm -hmm. we probably dealt with that. We said, how are you today? Boom, half an hour later all about their right. life right. other folks don't want to do that they're, they're for every reasons that they're not comfortable or they're not ready yet or whatever and so they don't you know and again it's just being able to give them time and space to do what they feel comfortable with right their level of disclosure which right. i which i love i also want to mention uh, just in terms of a, a previous question we do have some stats now and i want to thank neil delin for emailing us in to answer neil Toff's question in terms of, of just some quick stats for you this is from the temkin group bruce temkin uh engaged employees are 8.9 times more likely to recommend a company 5.3 times more likely to recommend an improvement and 4.7 times more likely to do something good for the company. And that's important. And again, three and a half times more likely to stay late if work needs to be done. So again, that sense of wellness, of connection, of engagement just improves performance as well because people care because they feel cared about. And that's really crucial as well. Just one last thing we'll mention before we go back to the next sort of formal question on the program. And this is for Jamie, just a question for you. In terms of, of this, can you share a bit more about the energy of team members? I mean, you know, in, in terms of what's there, you know, how important is it for, for leaders and also the, the frontline people to have that sense of energy? And where does that energy come from as far as relation to wellness? So it's a great question. And, and it actually goes to the to the next sort of formal slide is how do you get energy and, and you know, where we, if you can sort of imagine, we have sort of a, a bucket of energy. And as we are working and dealing with stressors of our lives, that energy is sort of sucked out. Um, and, and when we have that sort of depletion uh, of that energy, that's where it really turns into burnout. So the idea really here with energy is to Fill that bucket as much as you can with the things that give you energy. Um, you know, and as Jenny was saying before, it really is individual, right? There are certain things that, um, that I'm going to share that will give us sort of, that are, you know, notable for energy, such as, you know, physical activity. You know, the first thing anyone will say is to deal with stress and burnout, 
you know, there's a buildup of cortisol in our body, which is the stress hormone. And the more that we can, the best way to dispense that, that stress and that strain is through any form of physical activity. If you're not someone who's a runner, no problem. You like boxing, great. Um, I know we're a little bit confined because of the pandemic, right? So we can't, a lot of people can't really go to the gym like they necessarily used to, but you know, we can still go for a walk outside um, as the temperatures get a little bit colder, bundle up um, and go for a walk outside, but move, do some form of moving, even if it, you know, it is throwing on, you know, a, a yoga tape um, or, you know, on YouTube or throwing on just, if you are someone who likes to dance, throw on music, uh, lots of dance parties in our living room here, but find some way to physically dispense that energy. Um, another way, so, so really the formula here is to put in the good energy and dispense that bad energy, right? Mm -hmm. um, another great way to sort of put in that, that good energy is through meditation. Um, and there are a variety of different types of meditations. Um, if you're new to meditation, there are a couple of apps um, that you can download for free. There's one called Calm, which is great. And it just really guides you through meditation. Um, and there are different categories such as stress or anxiety or depression. There's another app called Headspace. And all you really have to do is just select the category of the type of meditation you want to do and how long you want to do it and just start for like five minutes. That's all you really need and just sort of get familiar with it. And that's a great way to kind of pause and put energy back into your system because so much of strain and stress is, is all the things we have to do and our mind is constantly you know, buzzing on all the things that need to get done. And so having some, some space, some quiet space to meditate is gonna put fuel back in the tank, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is journaling, another great dispensary of that negative energy sit down, open a book, and just dump it out. It's sort of like taking out the garbage, right? Just dump it out. And the other sort of benefit to the journaling is sometimes when you can see things uh, visually down in front of you, it can kind of help to give you a different perspective on things as well. Um, so in addition to being sort of that, that negative energy dispensary, journaling can be a great way to actually work through those problems at the same time. Um, we all know, of course, um, as someone who does counseling, that if you find as though you need some additional support, a counselor can be a great way to get some additional, you know, tools and skills to help you manage through that stress more effectively. Um, there are therapists out there who just work with other therapists. So even we have to sort of raise the, the white flag and say, you know, man down, we need some help. Um, so a therapist or a counselor can be a great way to get that support. Um, and that's something that, that, that hopefully your company can um, provide that as well and allow you to get the support that you need. And then there is social activity is a great way to put energy back in the tank, right? Being around with other people is going to, especially in the pandemic right now, um, I know you know, Neil can attest, I'm probably more social now than I actually have been before um, because I know how important it is to connect with other people, right? In this pandemic, part of the burnout is feeling, you know, so disconnected. And so having that time with other people and creating that sense of connection can, you know, really elicit and trigger those, you know, that serotonin and the oxytocin, those feel good uh, chemicals in the brain um, that put energy back in the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, sleep, huge. Okay. Sleep, right? Mm -hmm. um, so make sure, you know, if you can, eight hours, um, essential, right? There's tons of sleep studies, which I don't think we have time for right now, but I just want to give you the sort of the nuts and bolts. Um, but high level, that's where your body and your mind is repairing, right? So make sure that you are trying to get, that you are aiming for eight hours of sleep. Um, hobbies is another way to, to regain that sense of energy and put that fuel back in the tank. And whether it's needlepoint or chess or singing, whatever it is, find a hobby that you can do on a regular basis to put some fuel in the tank. Um, and then there is obviously healthy eating and um, gratitude. Gratitude can be a great way to put fuel back in a tank. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, write down 
one to three things that you're grateful for. Um, and it doesn't have to be sort of grandiose things. It could be, you know, I'm looking outside my window and there's not a cloud in the sky and it is just blue. Um, or, you know, that, that, that first snowfall where you've got that thin layer of snow or, you know, our fireplace is working now. Um, so it could be the seemingly mundane things, but when you do that, your brain starts to, to kind of rejig and look for the positive things. And you start to, to refuel that bucket that I was talking about. And so when the negative things happen, you don't get sort of, you know, knocked upside the head because you have this big bucket of, of that energy back. Right. Right. And those are really great tips, Jamie. I really like that in terms of the things that you mentioned. And again, you know, exercise, sleep, eating well, all those things you can do to reduce stress, build up energy. And it's really important because customer service, of course, customer experience can be very emotionally draining. And anyone who's taken calls from irates or escalations, you know, it can be really draining. And so being able to fill that bucket back up is so important you know, to do. And I love those tips that you shared, Jamie. Thank you for doing that. Because again, I know a lot of us don't necessarily take the best care. Um, I've been guilty of eating at my desk, gobbling a sandwich at my desk while checking emails, you know, things like that. We're all guilty of doing those things. So, you know, I really appreciate those tips in terms of being able to combat that and, and build the energy level back up. And I know we do have a few other questions as well, but we have a second question to answer period just near the end of, of today's program. So I'll actually save those questions till, till then. And I just want to ask uh, Jenny yourself a question as well. What's been one of the ways that as a contact center leader, you've been able to support mental health for your contact center agents? Well, one of the ways that I have found is setting boundaries and creating space for agents to care for themselves. And what I mean by that is as a manager, I wanna be there for my team. I wanna to listen to them. I want to celebrate them, you know, all the things. Um, but there are some times that I have to remind myself and, you know, I'm not a therapist and my manager is not a therapist. And so when really difficult things come up in personal life, um, or if someone is struggling with something mental health related that is in regards to maybe something that happened at work. Sometimes we have to remember that we are not the therapists as managers and it is okay to suggest to someone to talk to a therapist like Jamie had mentioned that there are great people out there that can help. Um, but the thing that it comes back to is giving the agent the opportunity to own that and to make those decisions for themselves. Cause that is that, you know, someone can make a suggestion to someone else, but it's up to that individual. And, you know, if we are as a company creating the flexibility and the structure and the tools and resources to allow the agents to, you know, have, whether it be time off for an appointment or, you know, use an app like Headspace, for example, some companies offer that for free to their, you know, to their agents. Um, or there's um, the app based uh, mental health uh, therapists or things like that. So just having resources available. And those have been some of the most successful ways that I have found contact center agents can really thrive because they're making choices for themselves and it's not being forced upon them. And I love that perspective too, that you're actually offering resources, offering alternatives, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, working with your, you know, human resources team, perhaps they work with external consultants, therapists, counselors, et cetera, and employee assistance programs, right? EEP programs, things like that as well, but all those great resources that are there. And then as a contact center leader, not being a therapist, but being a contact center leader, director, manager, being able to go and offer those you know, to your employees is really important as well. Just again, let them know what support is available. It's really important. So Jenny, thank you for that. I love that. And Lisa, for yourself, a question for you is, in terms of looking at this, sorry, I just wanna go back a bit. Okay, there we go. Actually, sorry, um, Lisa, I'll get to your question in just a moment. <laughs> sorry about that. Jamie, I know you mentioned a lot in terms of being able to help deal with, you know, tools and techniques to deal with, man with burnout itself, um, counseling being one of them that you've mentioned already. What's one other thing that, that contact center leaders can do to really help their teams be able to go and deal with burnout more effectively? So I think just sort of adding on to, to exactly what, you know, what Jenny was saying before, which is sort of making it available, but also really having it incorporated and embedded into the culture from the top down, right? Because oftentimes what I hear from employees is, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's offered, but it's not really 
promoted or it's not really supported, they sort of, it's a little bit of a sort of a band-aid approach, right? Like here we have it, then we can check off the box that we're offering it, but really not just have it available, but really promote it, um, really promote it internally and, you know, have the leaders sort of walk the walk. I know a lot of companies right now um, are starting to actually have um, internal therapists on board so that it's, you know, you're kind of reducing that, that stigma and the shame that it is, this is becoming the norm, that this is just as important as marketing or finance or HR, that we really believe in this. Um, and so I think not just having it available, having those programs available, but really promoting it, uh, walking the walk from the leadership perspective, um, and, and letting people, the, the other sort of challenge I see with people is that their sort of benefits are, are tied to certain criteria or practitioners. So, so firstly, financially, there needs to be more, um, but also it's limited to certain types of providers where I think if companies can just kind of go here, here's what you have available, you choose who you kind of want to work with because I think that's oftentimes where people get stuck because this type of, you know, burnout and stress and anxiety is such a, a personal issue that you really want to find the right person for you. And, um, you know, in order for you to, to be vulnerable and to be open up to a person, you have to feel that level of comfort. And so I think to really support the employees, I think the company has to really kind of broaden this perspective and say, here's all the support that we have available. You choose who you, who you feel you would feel, uh, you know, the best with. Okay, and good. we'll do that. We'll make that happen. Right. Well, and I love that perspective too. Again, it's just that human to human connection. Not everyone clicks right away. Not everyone's going to be a perfect match with a certain therapist or counselor. So I love the idea about having a, a range of people you can turn to. And the other point that you mentioned, I love was a part about, again, it has to be, you know, from the top down that the culture has to be there. And, you know, and, and that's why, I, Jenny, I love the fact that you began, you know, the session by talking about your own personal experience. Because as a leader, just revealing that it's the very first thing that we talked about during today's session, just I think gave the rest of us space to go and talk about how we might be hurting or how we might be, you know, feeling a lot of stress right now as well. So again, that vulnerability is really important and it comes from the top down, you know, being authentic and letting people share. So Jamie, thank you for that. I really appreciate the perspective on, on counseling and coaching and how we're able to go and help, you know, help our employees moving forward. And I just want to ask one other question as well. And this is of the audience. So for those of you that are, are watching this at home or from your offices, I want to launch another poll right now. Quick little question for you. This is our second poll. It's what percentage of your contact center team will remain work from home once a pandemic is over? So looking ahead to 2021, maybe the second half of 2021, what percentage will still be work from home? 100%, 75% uh, work from home, 25% back in the office, you know, all the way down to 100% all back in the office. What do you think? So again, feel free to vote what percentage of your contact center team will remain work from home once the pandemic is over. And we'll take a look at those results and share them. And after that, I know Lisa, I wanna ask you a question in terms of again, staying connected with people you know, that are gonna be work from home. But first we'll take a look at the poll. And I'll give it a few more seconds just so you can finish uh, um, doing the poll survey. I'm just going to share the results now. So again, you can see it in front of you. And the most common answer, almost half, was 50% work from home and then 50% on site. So again, the idea of a hybrid team, of a team being half on site and then half remote as well. So that hybrid team concept is pretty big. And even the other answers that are there, some are going 100% on site, some are going 100% work from home, but it seems like a mix is also you know, there as well. And of course, one of the keys with that is that work from home in some portion, whether it's part of your contact center or all of it, really is here to stay for a lot of different uh, contact center organizations. And so Lisa, the question I've got for you looking at that, if that's true is, you know, what are some of the things or initiatives that you've currently implemented or you're working on to go and keep your teams engaged while working from home? 
Sure. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that um, we've done, you know, in our contact center is, you know, creating, you know, some sort of monthly contest. Um, and it could be an idea around, um, you know, a defined KPI, you know, you're trying to improve your CSAT scores. So who has the best CSATs for the week? Um, who has the best, um, you know, who had the best call for the week? You know, so there's a different things that we can do. We've created a, a, a kind of a wall of fame and um, you know so it, it's it's a monthly contest but it's based on what's happening on each week and so you know a little friendly competition between the agents is always good um, and it, it, it helps them elevate their game a little bit more and you know so we're putting out some you know gift cards at the end or you know some cake or you know we just like I said before we just had a pizza party for for the team. Um, the other thing that we're looking at too is we use a platform called Lessonly, which is an e-learning platform. And um, so my one of my in-house team, one of their responsibilities is they're creating um, different lessons, and they can be based around customer service, or they can be based around you know Blue Diamond's new products that are launching, or different packaging. And so they're creating videos, or they're creating you know different fun kind of quizzes, and you you know, they're gradable. And so we pick that as part of, you know, who had the best score and, you know, they become dynamic and they become really engaging. And so this is a great way to keep people engaged while they're at home, you know, but it's also educational. They're, they're learning about, Hey, you know, what's happening with blue diamond, whether it's, you know, a packaging update or, you know, something that they can easily reference when they're on a call with a consumer. And so, you know, there's some great programs out there that you can do to really keep them engaged, um, keep them up to date on what's happening within, you know, within at least with the Blue Diamond organization so that they can talk to it when our consumers are calling. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, it's, again, it's just a little bit of friendly competition that we're working on and creating a wall of fame and who's making the wall, who, who, who's on the wall of fame for, you know, the month of December, things like that. Okay, great. Excellent. You know, a great idea is there to keep your work from home agents engaged because it's so easy for them to feel a sense of isolation, a sense of they're in their apartment or they're in their, you know, their house, their living room and not seeing anyone else at the office, you know, other than a few, you know, Zoom chats every now and again. So those are great ideas to keep them engaged, keep them motivated, make them feel a part of the overall family, you know, part of the overall company, which is so important. So I love that. Thank you. And, and, and Andrew's looking at questions and answers again. Now, there were some other questions that came in. Um, this one's actually from Mayanna, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And her question is, we have an outsourcing company handling our contacts. Uh, how do we at head office become more engaged with the agents that we don't usually have direct interactions with? And are there any best practices that you would suggest? I'll just open this up in terms of any experiences you've had in terms of working with outsourcers and being able to keep them engaged. What do you think? Well, I've worked with outsourcing teams before, and one of the fun, and this was pre-COVID, so this was when we were, half the team is in the office and the outsourcing team obviously was elsewhere, um, but we'd incorporate them into our regular customer service meetings with our in-house team. Um, and it was one of the easiest ways we had an internal uh, communications channel, which this was even before Slack, um, but you could use Slack now, uh, where you can talk to one another. So you're able to like have these usual conversations, ask questions. I think in this day and age, there's like, what I really love is um, Zoom has that option where you can break out into groups. So cheesy, I didn't even know it existed before all this happened, but it was when I like was onboarded, for example, into a new company, I had that opportunity to get to know new coworkers by being broken out into these random groups. Um, and so it helped me engage and interact with people that I might normally not ever talk to. And now I have as a contact and I've seen their faces and that type of experience. So I think there, you just have to get a little creative, but technology could help a lot with that, at least from what I've seen in my, my experience. Okay, great. Excellent. And, and Lisa, how about yourself? What would your advice be in that scenario about working with an outsourcer? Um, and so I do work with an outsourcer. I, I, mean, I have an in-house team and I've got an outsourced team. And um, I think it's really, really important that they feel that they are part of the company that they're representing. Um, and so I have a dedicated team and, and they consistently work on, on, on Blue Diamond, you know, answering our calls, our emails, our chats, our texts. Um, and so it's very, very important that they feel part of 
the culture that Blue Diamond has. And so, um, again, I, I sit on calls, you know, with the entire team, you know, each month. Um, and again, going back to my pizza party, I had ordered pizzas for all of them um, by way of, you know, now they're located in, in Bogota, Colombia. And, um, but, you know, through the, all the things that we can do is, you know, to be able to do something local, you know, working with the supervisor, say, hey, I want to have pizza party, you know, let's go ahead and, and order pizzas and you guys set it up. Um, but then being on the phone with them, I thought really made a, uh, hopefully made a great difference <clears throat> in showing how much that, you know, we care for them, you know, from Blue Diamond. And, um, you know, so I think it's really important to be part of their activities um, so that they can feel that they're part of the company that they're representing. Okay, good. All right. I like that, Lisa, as well. And that's so important because you're right, you're representing the company. And so that culture has to be there. And sometimes when I, I know sometimes when I call places, I can kind of tell if it's an outsourcer versus the, the actual company's employees just by the way they operate, just by how they sound and what they're doing. So you want that tight integration, right, when they're representing yep. you. So I like that. All right, good. So Jenny and Lisa, thank you very much for answering that question from our audience. Uh, I got a question for you, Jamie, as well. This one's, again, I know you do a lot of work in terms of consulting with organizations and consulting with leaders in, in different organizations. So the question for you is we've talked so far really a lot about being able to go and help support our frontline agents, frontline team leaders, being able to help support them. But what about as leaders? So what can we do in terms of being a contact center, you know, manager, director, VP? What should we be doing to help ourselves? Because oftentimes we put our front line first and then get burnt out ourselves. So what's some advice there, Jamie, to help us? We have to walk the walk. We got to do all those same things, right? Because if we don't have that, that energy, you know, that tank filled, we're not going to have anything to be able to give. So all the more reason why we have to, you know, do the physical activity, do the meditation, get in, do the counseling, get everything as much as you can in the social activities, the hobbies, um, the gratitude for a lot of people. Spirituality is a great one. Um, and more specifically, I mean, sort of practicing these sort of values of compassion and respect, you know, towards yourself, towards other people. Um, a lot of times what happens is when we focus our sort of energy on giving to others, actively practicing acts of compassion, that fuels our tank and also helps us to kind of get a little more perspective on what's happening with us as well. So I would say find a way to, as best you can, of course, because we're working from home and kids and all that stuff, um, to incorporate sort of a daily routine um, that has some element, even if it's, you know, 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day to do some physical activity, go for a walk with your kids, or, you know, just 20 minutes before you go to bed, do a meditation, do some gratitude and some journaling um, is going to really help to kind of dispense that negative energy and, and, and bring in that new energy that then you can bring to your team and be, be able to give to other people. Okay, good. And that's great advice, Jamie. I, I really appreciate that as well. Just, just being able to recharge as a, as a leader. And, and Lisa, for yourself, what's one thing that you do to just recharge yourself so you've got something left to give to your team at Blue Diamond? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, again, just, just finding that balance between work and life. And, you know, it's so easy to be looking at emails at eight or nine o'clock at night. And um, so I make a point of, you know, shutting down my computer. I don't just leave it on and leave the office. I shut it down like I'm going home. And so it's really critical that you find that time. And, um, you know, one of the things that we were talking about earlier is, you know, we're instituting what we call no meeting Fridays. And so, you know, being able to have some time, you know, to really close things up so that, you know, when you're going home and you're with your family, you're not thinking about work and you're not, you know, oh my God, I didn't answer that email. It's, it's finding, it's being able to find that balance is really, really important so that, you know, it's not keeping you up at night and you're getting your eight hours of sleep as, as Jamie had said. And, um, you know, so those are the things, you know, just little things of finding that balance. And it, it's, 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 just as easy, shut down your computer at the end of your day. Don't leave it open where you walk by and see that you have an email. It's, it's really, really important that you find that balance. Okay, good, excellent. I, I love that. And, and Jamie, or, sorry, Jenny, how about yourself as well? What's one that you do to recharge yourself as a leader? 
Well, one thing is setting boundaries, um, whether that is with work or whether that is with just different people in my life, you know, energy can be taken uh, in all different ways. And so I'm very strict with like my phone. So like, you know, I don't check my phone first thing when I wake up. Uh, I don't check in until like two hours later. Um, and the same thing at night. Um, I don't have work stuff on my phone either. Um, and I, what Lisa said, like shutting the computer down, actually going to shut down. Um, but also like staying consistent with physical activity for me is very important, but I do it from the angle of like, this is going to help my stress levels. I don't ever work out or exercise for, you know, this whole fact to look a certain way or to, um, you know, lose weight, for example. So for me, it's all about like, if I'm doing yoga or going for a walk, like I'm enjoying it. I only want to do physical movement that I actually enjoy. Um, and, uh, not eating lunch at my desk, Mike, come <laughs> on now, you know, that stuff gets in the keyboard. Let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm gonna work it out myself, right? Be focusing yeah. on wellness as well. Right. But those, those are great examples. I appreciate that from all three of you in terms of just being able to help yourself and give yourself permission as a leader, walk the talk, role model the right behaviors. Because again, if you're sending an email at midnight, your team's gonna feel like they should be answering it. So you wanna turn that computer off, which I love the two of you saying as well. And Jamie, great advice about being able to recharge and being able to keep that energy level up, you know, going forward as well. So I wanna thank all three of you for just for sharing so much, you know, with, with our audience today and just sharing those tips as well. That's wonderful to hear. And, and we just have a couple of quick announcements as well, just to make, just to wrap up today's session. And we also have as well, a final quick little musical message as well. So a little extra treat for you to go and end off the year. First though, a couple of quick announcements. One of them is in terms of GTAC. So this event is a joint GTAC, uh, Greater Toronto Area Contact Center Association event, working along with Intelligence. And so for GTAC, I just want to mention that GTAC's Women in Leadership event, virtual event is coming up. It's on March the 8th, 2021. That's International Women's Day. And it's a, it's a wonderful event. It's held every year. Some amazing speakers sharing in terms of their experiences and great lessons learned and advice as well in terms of leadership. So really powerful event. And more information is there available at gtac.ca. So gtacc.ca. As well, I also want to mention another event. It's related to GTAC as well, which is being put on by one of our GTAC board members, Neil DeLynn. And it's a charity fundraiser for Camp Ooch, which is a camp that's really meant to go and help children who have cancer and who are recovering from cancer to go and have wonderful camp experiences. And so this fundraising event, it's a wonderful musical show that's put on every year. And this year it's virtual and the tickets are available at www.unsungtickets.com. It's actually on Sunday night. So there's still time for you to go and buy your ticket and make a donation if you'd like to. So it's a wonderful event that you can actually do to support the community and be able to support children going forward. Also as well, I wanna thank 8x8 and Intelligence, the sponsors for today's session. And they do so much to go and be able to help us put on this event going forward. So thank you for that as well. And finally, we have one musical event. So we have a little musical message here from Jenny Dempsey. And Jenny, I see you got your guitar out, so let you take it away. I'm ready. This wellness stuff, it's not all about kale. It's not all about massages and green juice. There's more to it because there's more to you. And for us in customer service, in order to take the best care of others we must first take the best care of ourselves right so let's start now not sweep this under the rug this wellness stuff it's not all about kale there's more to it because there's more to you got a little nervous there but Thanks for that. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jay, thank you for that. A great way to go and end off the show and also the year as well. And just on behalf of, of you know of the audience, I want to thank all three of you for being on the panel. Lisa, Jamie, and Jenny, thank you for sharing with us and giving us such great advice and great tips and such heartfelt experiences as well. It'll definitely help us get ready and recharge for 2021. So thank you for doing that. And as well for all of you at home and at the office watching this, thank you as well for coming out and sharing your time with us and hopefully getting some good tips and ideas uh, you know, from this event. And I want to wish everybody, both all of you, you know, Jenny, Lisa, and Jamie on the panel, as well as everybody watching at home, I want to wish all of you as well the very best for 2021. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. <laughs>